Hi, I'm Mike Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is presidential elections in Iran. On May 19th, Iran is going to the polls to vote for their president. This will be the 12th time in the history of Iran, ever since the revolution in 1979, that the Iranians will be casting this ballot. As of now, Hassan Rouhani, the incumbent, is running for a second term. Rouhani is a moderate. He won an election running on a moderate platform and is governed as a moderate. His crowning achievement as president of Iran was the signing of the famous nuke deal in March of 2015, the deal that Donald Trump, while still campaigning for his own presidency, said he would rip up on his first day in office. For Iran, the nuke deal was important, but even more important than signing and uh, the deal was lifting of sanctions, because that's what brought Iran back into the community of nations. Doors were opened, and Iran is now pumping and exporting oil, making money and buying the essential goods that had been, until a short while ago, embargoed. Whatever you think about Iran, know this. Rouhani is definitely a political moderate, albeit an Iranian moderate. There is a world of difference between Iran's definition of the term moderate and moderate Republicans or Democrats of the West. He is a moderate relative to the extremists of Iran, compare him, let's say, to his predecessor, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, and the point becomes obvious. Ahmadinejad has also expressed interest in running for the presidency again. He declared his intentions during appearances on TV and radio. But Iran being Iran, it's not primaries and polls that determine the candidate's ability to run for office. It's the permission of the Grand Ayatollah. And when Ahmadinejad asked permission from the supreme leader, the Grand Ayatollah Khamenei, he was given a flat-out no. Ahmadinejad made some further overtures at running, but they too were quickly squelched. Without being blessed by the supreme leader, no one may run, let alone win. The presidency of Iran, period. And while Ahmadinejad was once chosen by Iran's supreme leader to be the political head of the country, over time, Khamenei grew wary and weary of him, and tensions emerged, so much so that Ahmadinejad actually challenged the supreme leader on several occasions. Rouhani was always a compromised candidate. He was the moderate that Khamenei thought would be able to bridge divisions in Iran. The supreme leader always knew that it was the lifting of sanctions that was so important for the country, not the nuke deal itself. From the outset, Khamenei has been ambivalent and quiet about the nuke part of the deal. His only interests and public statements were about the lifting of sanctions. There are those who say that an election in Iran is a sham. While they are not U.S.-style elections, they are, however, elections. The Supreme Leader most assuredly plays an important role in tapping the candidate who will become president. But there are a series of essential steps that are required in Iran's presidential election, and they should not be overlooked. Candidates must pass a series of tests. Each one is vetted by the election monitoring committee of the Guardian Council, and it is they who select a handful of candidates who may run for office. In June of 2009, some 36,000 candidates threw their hat, their name into the hat. In the election of 2013, 680 people applied, and the committee quickly narrowed it down to eight. Candidates must believe in God, the official religion of, of Iran, which is Shiite Islam. They must be born in Iran and be over 21 years old. Candidates over 75 years old are permitted to run, but only after receiving special medical dispensation from the committee. Until 2007, the age at which Iranians could vote was 15. It was then increased to the age of 18. Youth play a very large role in Iran's elections and in the total population as a whole. Over 40% of Iran is under the age of 24. The timeline of elections is tight and the span is short. The election is scheduled for May 19th, as I said, and the candidates can only register between April 10th and April 14th. That's 2017, not 2016. 
The final list of candidates is published 10 days later, on April 24th. Campaigning starts April 27th and runs for two, until two days before the election, which is on May 19th. That makes the entire campaign exactly 20 days long. The results are announced the next day on May 20th, and the inauguration for president is on August 1st. When Donald Trump rocked the world by winning the election in the United States, Iran was stunned, as were other countries. The uh, upset and the impact and the implications were, to use the United States president-elect's nomenclature, huge. In a survey that was conducted in Iran before Trump emerged triumphant, Rouhani was hands down the favorite for president. Newer polls put Ahmadinejad back in the game when he and Rouhani run in an open field with six other candidates. In those polls, Rouhani is only up 27 to 21 against Ahmadinejad, considering that Ahmadinejad has been a declined as a candidate by the Supreme Leader, the situation does not bode well for the moderate candidate and sitting president, Rouhani. Given the new occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue come January, it is unclear how the Supreme Leader and the rest of Iran will react in their voting booths on May 19th. Iran is also planning to open distant nasal, naval bases in Syria and Yemen. This is a very aggressive and telling move for Iran. It should be extremely worrying to the Sunni Muslims in the region. But they're not the only countries which should worry. This move is also a threat against the rest of the world. The plan was made public in a news piece published in Sharga Daily, a newspaper, an Iranian official news outlet. It quoted an important general, Muhammad Hussein Barak Bakari. He said, quote, we need distant bases, and it may become possible one day to have bases on the shores of Yemen and, or Syria, or bases on islands, or floating bases, said General Bakari. Then he rhetorically asks, is having distant bases less important than nuclear technology? I say it's worth dozens of times more. To even suggest that these bases are more important than the nuclear deal is huge. These new bases will be asserting a new power and putting Shiite Iran in close range of almost every regional center in the Middle East. Continuing with world security and safety, 10 countries from around the globe work together, coordinating their efforts, utilizing their counter cyber resources, and arresting and shutting down one of the largest cyber crime syndicates in history. Germany was the focal point of the raid. In the end, 16 people were arrested, that's all, in 10 different countries, but the group carried out their investigation in 40 different countries. There were an impressive set of numbers here. 39 servers were confiscated. 50,000 computers were confiscated. It's the biggest botnet ever. I call it a virtual zombie army infecting 900,000 routers. The routers were all infected with malicious software, each of them sending out notes that asked recipients to click or open an email. If they clicked, their system became part of the botnet. Deutsche Telekom was attacked. They repelled the attack, but it did bring down the entire German internet to an absolute freeze for a few minutes. Over a million emails were sent out each week through this botnet. The objectives were numerous. Cyber terrorists were gathering and selling information and intel, as well as gaining access to many high-value targets. And now it's over. Mission accomplished. Coming up next, points of view. Here are what some important voices have been talking about. First up is a column from the Jerusalem Post. It was published on November 20th, 2016, and was written by Jeff Barak. It's entitled, Reality Check, An Empty Record. Barak is a regular columnist at the Post. He was a former editor of the Jerusalem Post. He was editor-in-chief, actually, in the 1990s. Barak originally hails from the United Kingdom. He is a product of the Zionist youth movement, Habonim. Last week, I disclosed that I, too, am a columnist for the Jerusalem Post. So that disclaimer continues this week again. Barak and I were in school together in Israel at the Mechon Madrache Chutzlaretz, the Institute for Youth Leaders from Abroad, where representatives from Jewish movements from all over the world come together and learn for an entire year together in Israel. At the time, his name was Jeff Black. He Hebraicized his name to Barak. The essence of this column is a critique of Netanyahu and a serious dose of skepticism about the Trump presidency's Israel policy. This is how Barack begins 
He begins with tongue-in-cheek and, of course, humor. You know we're in trouble when the Victor Lieberman suddenly becomes the responsible adult in the room. In the absence of a full-time foreign minister, one more example of Prime Minister Netanyahu's scandalous disregard for good government, the defense minister last week outlined a clear and rational vision for Israeli settlement policy vis-a-vis -vis the incoming Trump administration. Barack is correct. Lieberman is on target. Lieberman is always a great strategist, even when or if you disagree with them. And then Barack laces into the right, especially Bennett and Netanyahu, about their totally unrealistic expectations of the new U.S. president. He continues. Unlike the delusional education minister, Naftali Bennett, who impetuously crowed that Donald Trump's victory means the era of a Palestinian state is over, and that it presents an opportunity to rest and rethink everything. During a briefing with diplomatic reporters, Defense Minister Lieberman suggested a more restrained approach, correctly noting that the right approach to Trump's victory was not to make declarations, but rather to sit tight and wait to see who is in the administration, who is in the key jobs, and then coordinate the positions. Lieberman also set down an interesting marker for Israel's settlement activities. Barack shows that Bennett and Lieberman are making a tragic error. He writes, while the Likud and Bayat Yehudi are expending the entire government's energy on endangering the rule of law and whitewashing the criminality of 2,000 Israeli families living in houses built illegally on privately owned Palestinian land, a figure that represents some 0.3% of the Israeli population living over the Green Line, Lieberman took a wider view. Then Barak gives some historical perspective. Going back eight years to the last Republican president, he writes, Going back to the last Republican to sit in the Oval Office, George W. Bush, Lieberman enthusiastically endorses the understanding reached between Bush and then Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, under which Israel could continue to build in the settlement blocks, but would freeze construction in isolated settlements outside of the blocks. In his uh, few paragraphs uh, that continue, Barack presents a sense of reality and leaves politics aside. This is how he puts it. But just as no one has a real clue as to how Trump will act once he takes over as president, no one knows what drives Netanyahu, except for his determination to dominate each day's news cycle and survive another day in office. When you compare his lack of actual achievements compared to Ben-Gurion, whose record he's eclipsed, it's embarrassing. Barack now offers an even harsher critique of Netanyahu, actually comparing Netanyahu to Ehud Barak, a totally failed prime minister. He writes, heavens, he's even achieved less in his years in office than Ayo Barak during his ridiculously short term. Barak at least made good on his campaign promise to bring the IDF out of Lebanon. A new Republican administration, in theory, is exactly what Netanyahu has been dreaming of ever since he first became prime minister in 1996 and had to deal with a skeptical Bill Clinton in the White House, followed in his present stint by two terms of, Ob of the Obama administration who also viewed him with some distaste. Now the Prime Minister has the chance to chart Israel's future with what he believes will be a friendly U.S. administration. Perhaps we will finally get a glimpse of Netanyahu's vision of the country. But on the basis of Netanyahu's 3,900 empty days in office so far, I wouldn't hold your breath. Barack writes in a model that has been common for decades in Israel. He pits left against right, suggesting that the right is wrong because the right is unrealistic in their expectations. That may be true, but the real motivation for the column is just to lash out against Netanyahu. Second up is not a column. It's a letter from the leadership of a segment of the Muslim community in the United States to President-elect Trump. The piece is truly insightful in understanding the nature of the Muslim leadership in the U.S. This is how it begins. This letter is addressed to Reince Priebus, chair of the Republican National Committee, and Trump's chief of staff. President-elect Donald J. Trump, care of Reince Priebus, Republican National Committee chairman, 310 First Street, Southeast Washington, D.C., 20003. Dear President-elect Trump, we, a cross-section of Muslim American leaders, recognize your recent election victory and commit ourselves and our organizations to work together with you and your administration to make America great for all its people. 
as you prepare to take office, we invite you to meet with us and other Muslim leaders as soon as possible, preferably before this month's end. During this meeting, we hope to offer our advice on both domestic and international policy, recommend talented Muslim Americans to work in your administration, and discuss other opportunities to help this nation expand the promise of freedom and prosperity for all. We also want to extend to you and Mrs. Trump an invitation to attend the Muslim American inaugural gala and golden minaret award scheduled for Saturday, January 21st, 2017. They want to meet with the president-elect, but they ask it in a very unusual way. They invite him to meet with them. <laughs> this is backwards. A group or a person normally asks for a meeting with the president, not the opposite. What is probably a sincere invitation becomes hilarious and improbable, and especially in their invite to their Minaret Awards, which takes place on the very day that Trump will be sworn in as 45th president of the United States. The letter continues. In recent days, many in our community have felt apprehension about the election results. Our concerns are due to your statements made during the campaign season, including a proposal to ban Muslims from entering the U.S., increase surveillance of Muslim places of worship, and expand the New York-styled stop and frisk policing program nationwide, which we and many in the legal community view as unlawful racial profiling. We therefore invite you to engage us in an open-minded and fruitful discussion of these and other proposed policies from your campaign, which we believe run counter to our shared goals of American greatness. If implemented, these proposals could subject our fellow citizens and allies to increased threats at home and abroad. They are correct. Open communication is an essential part of success, especially in dealing with the Muslim community in the U.S. This is especially true if we have any hope that this leadership will influence their communities. The letter continues. Our community of some 9 million Americans include physicians, educators, lawyers, as well as members of the nation's armed forces. History shows that Muslim Americans were amongst the earliest American pioneers and contributed greatly to this country since its founding. With this in mind, we are comforted about your recent statements about being inclusive as the president of all Americans, including those who subscribe to the Islamic tradition. We would be happy to meet you in the next week or two at your office in New York or D.C. Then they give a name and phone number and email address, and they sign the letter, respectfully, the undersigned Muslim American leaders. I was very happy to see this letter, and that it was printed in numerous Muslim newspapers across America, and websites too, by the way. It does appear very clumsy, but it's better than nothing. I am certain the transition team will take this very seriously. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. All three cartoons today are about Turkey and the EU. EU and Turkey are at odds with one another, literally loggerheads. The European leadership is not happy with Turkey at all. Turkey has been trying to ascend into the EU for decades. But in November, the European Parliament voted to suspend negotiations with Turkey about their ascent over violations of human rights and issues over the rule of law in Turkey. Erdogan, president of Turkey, was quick to respond by saying he would unleash a flood of refugees into Europe. His first cartoon is entitled Munitions. It's drawn by Peter Pismatsrovich, and it was published in an Austrian paper called Kleine Zeitung on November 28, 2016. The cartoon depicts Erdogan lighting a fuse of a cannon with, Turkish, with a Turkish flag on it. In the canon are refugees, and it's pointed at the EU. The second cartoon was published on November 25, 2016. It's entitled Erdogan is Threatening with Refugees, and it was drawn by Marian Kamensky and was published in Slovakia. The cartoon deals with exactly the same theme, only it's far more coarse. In this cartoon, Erdogan has refugees in both hands, and he's throwing them at Europe as he shouts, Europe. This third and final cartoon is also about Turkey and the EU. It's also from a European country, from Bulgaria. The cartoon is entitled Turkey and Europe. and It was drawn by Christo Kermanarski. The cartoon depicts Erdogan in a cape, which is the flag of Turkey. And under the cape are the hands symbolizing refugees, reaching out at a lady cloaked in an EU flag 
as she looks terrified and seems as if she's running away from Turkey and the refugees. In the moment, my own perspective and a few predictions. Iraqi forces have killed as many as 1,000 ISIS soldiers and fighters in Mosul. Only one Iraqi unit actually entered Mosul from the east where the massive fighting took place. This group is called the Golden Division, and they are a highly elite, highly trained unit. The advance on Mosul has taken many, many weeks. The momentum is now squarely on the side of the Allies and the Iraqi establishment. But ISIS has constantly been surprising the Allies. I predict that they have other surprises up their sleeves. Russia has decided to send a field hospital to Aleppo, Syria. This hospital will provide 100 beds and will be able to serve 420 people daily in outpatient services. So many Syrians have been displaced. So many need medical help. Now Russia is bringing medical care with trained medical professionals. It's not pure altruism. Aleppo is in crisis, and Russia sees this as in their best interest to help. Russia only acts when it's in their best interest. They know how dangerous and how problematic the situation is in Syria, especially in Aleppo. But they need to secure the support of the masses against ISIS and al-Nusra, which is a branch of al-Qaeda. With the help of the masses, Russia can reestablish power and provide Syria with the stability that Syrians so badly need. Austrians went to the polls and voted for president. Ever since the U.S. presidential results came in, pundits in Austria and throughout Europe have been talking about the Trump effect and the Trump bounce. One Austrian candidate was the populist, a person named Norbert Hofer. He was pit against a liberal left-leaning Alexander van der Bellen. Elections everywhere across the world are trying to tap the phenomenon of Trump and the energy that Trump brought into the elections itself. Elections are often more about candidates than about issues today. The Trump-Clinton election broke even those barriers. In order to duplicate Trump-like effects, you can't just be like Trump. You have to be Donald Trump himself. In the case of Austria, the liberals won. Van der Bellen took 52 percent, and the conservative Hoffer took 46 percent. No recount here in Austria. Hamas radio reported that the bodies of three Palestinians were recovered in a smuggling tunnel. The smuggling tunnel ran from Gaza into Egypt. The Egyptians flooded the tunnel with seawater, and the tunnel collapsed with the smugglers inside. Flooding the tunnels was one of Egypt's most effective methods of confronting tunnel threats. All kinds of people and goods came in and went through the tunnels, and the Egyptians were powerless to stop them or even monitor what and who was coming in and going out. The issue came to a head in 2015 when it was clear that terror groups were shuttling people and weapons into and out of Egypt, and they were attacking Egyptian targets in major cities. And at that point, the Egyptians started flooding the tunnels. Throughout most of this year, however, Egypt has turned a blind eye to the tunnels themselves. One more observation. 2,465 refugees were rejected from Australia. They had been accepted to the United States. The refugees were being held in temporary camps in Papua New Guinea and Nauru as they tried to get into Australia. They came from Iran, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, Iraq, and Sudan. Some in Congress are livid. Two congressmen sent a scathing letter to U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry and Homeland Security Director Je Johnson, who agreed to accept these refugees from these dangerous countries. Senator Chuck Grassley, a Republican from Iowa, and Congressman Bob Goodlatte from Virginia condemned the situation as concerning for many reasons. Foremost because, and here's the quote, your departments negotiated an international agreement regarding refugees without consulting or notifying Congress, unquote. They said that Congress only learned about this deal through the media. The entire situation is unacceptable. We will see how it is resolved. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that the Jewish Agency and the State of Israel actually produced a booklet of guidelines on how to change names and how to make them Israeli, or what we call Hebraicize the name? 
Shimon Peres' original name was not Shimon Peres. He was from Poland, now Belarus. His original name was Simon Pirski. Simon to Shimon, that actually works, that's pretty easy. But Perez is actually in Hebrew a vulture or a hawk. Abba Ibn's original first name was Aubrey. Yitzchak Shamir was Isaac. Yezemitsky, again, Isaac to Yitzchak, that works, that's okay. And then Shamir is a green leafy vegetable which we call dill. Golda Meir, everyone knows, was Golda Meirson, shortened to Golda Meir. But Meirson was her married name. Her original name was Mabovitz. Last names are very new in Ashkenazi tradition. It all dates back to November 12, 1787, when Emperor Joseph II of Austria and the Habsburg Empire required compulsory surnames. Until then, Ashkenazi Jews had only a few last names, Cohen, Levy, Katz, etc. Jews of Spanish descent had longer, a much longer tradition of last names, dating back to before the 1400s. After Emperor Joseph II's edict, that point, Jews took on last names like Berg, Stein, which meant cities and places that they came from in German, or Ski or Witz in Slavic languages, meaning from, or ER, like Lubliner, meant the family was originally from Lublin. In Israel, they wanted people to be at one with the land and cast off their diaspora attachments. That was the Zionist ideal. Guidelines said change names like Lieb to Leib, Borg to Barak, Rosenberg to Roseanne, Yakovich to Yakobi, Abramovich to Ben Avraham. They suggested taking names of Holocaust victims and relatives and turning them into Hebrew memories like Ben Moshe, Bat Miriam. And of course, take Hebrew Israeli geographic sites and nature like Golani, Elat, Eshel, and Elon. Hebrew names, like much in Jewish life, resonate with meaning, history, and memory. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Halpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.